Hi, you're very welcome to this, the third episode of our update series. And today we have Dylan Roberts with us and Dylan is head of fisheries at the Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust. And he's also the project manager of the Samarsh program. We're joined as usual, of course, by Byron Pace. And Byron's doing a great job um, getting us into the discussion each time and hosting the actual series. But today's episode, we're going to concentrate a little bit on the Samarsh project. And the Samarsh project hosted the Marine Tracking Workshop, which we reported on very recently in our Blue Book series. So Byron, I'm going to hand over to you to chat away with Dylan and to get the ball rolling. And I'll jump in whenever you think I might be able to help out in terms of anything that we're chatting about. Thanks very much, Ken. Uh, Dylan, thanks for joining us today. Uh, I think a, gr a good place to start is just to tell me a little bit about your background before we, we talk about your role within the Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust. Well, I think as um, like many people working in this industry, um, started as a youngster catching fish and I always remember um, a date in my life, the 29th of July 1981, means very much to me. Um, that means much more to other people because it was the day that Charles and Diana got married. But <laughs> to me it was the day I caught my very first sea trout as a 12 year old. <laughs> and I always remember going home to show my parents and passing some friends who were going down to a, a street party and saying, Dylan, are you coming to the party? And I said, no, I'm taking this fish home and I'm going to catch another one. <laughs> that was it. I was hooked ever since. And I'm a lifelong passionate fisherman, very passionate about salmon and sea trout. I mean, grown up in West Wales and fish rivers like the Tyne and the Towy, renowned sea trout rivers. Um, and I'm very saddened to see how stocks have declined over the last you know, 10, 20 years in particular. So this, uh, this early experience of yours was was the catalyst for your areas of interest now so where did you what did you go and do what was your next step to, to pursue uh, indeed, this fascination indeed um the next step was to uh try in between fishing get myself educated so i graduated <laughs> with a degree in fisheries and then i started working with the national rivers authority and the early days of the environment agency in the mid 90s and then joined Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust in uh, 1998. Okay. I then became head of fisheries for the Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust in 2006. And then um, I've overseen uh, significant growth and development in our fishing work ever since. Mm, interesting. Yeah, I myself have done uh, a little bit of work with the Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust, and it's an organization that we, uh, we personally uh, support. I know that there'll be some people who are very aware of the organization, but possibly are not aware of the Salmon and Trout Research Center element of it. What do you guys do? Um, at the Salmon and Trout Research Center, which we set up in 2009, um, there's two sort of areas of work we focus on. One is um, our, what we call our core work, which is monitoring the um, population of salmon that come into the river each year and the numbers of juvenile salmon that leave the river each, each year as smolts. Um, this is building upon work that's been ongoing on the Froome since the 1970s. Um, the River Froome has probably one of the longest data sets on the return, numbers of returning adults in the world. Um, and for the last 20 years, um, they've been monitoring the numbers of smolts that leave the river. We picked up this research in 2009 and set up our Salmon and Trout Research Centre there and have been fine-tuning and developing it. And now we have a sophisticated array of pit tag readers in the river uh, which um, is based on, on all our work is based around tagging of 10,000 juvenile um, salmon each year, each September, and then monitoring them uh, through the winter and then out to sea um, at spring during smolts, and then the numbers are returning adults. So that's really our one of our core works. But in addition to that, we bolt on a number of associated projects to that. Um, given that we have the infrastructure in the river, we can look at issues such as uh, hydro schemes. Um, there is a hydro scheme on the Froome and we've done work where we've looked at the survival of our tag smolts coming through the hydro scheme compared to ones that don't. And then, you know, and then similar management issues. Hmm. And you're, you're using this information uh, that you obtain through research to better implement conservation measures within the river. Yes, indeed. But not only in the river, our salmon monitoring work feeds, in, feeds into an international network of salmon index rivers. 
These are rivers that collect um, detailed information on the numbers of um, adult salmon returning into the river, and some of them collect detailed information on the numbers of juveniles that leave the river. This information then is fed into uh, ICES um, salmon working groups, um, and also we do some similar work on trout, which feeds into the trout, ICES trout working group, and also nationally to governments and um, through the EU as well and to NASCO. I think that's a, a perfect lead into the main focus of our conversation today, which is this, the, the SAMA project, if I'm saying that correctly. What, uh, where, where did that start? What is the main objective of that program? Well, SAMARSH means um, Salmonid Management Around the Channel. And if you know any French, SAMARSH in French means Camarche means it works. So hopefully um, we'll find out that this project works um, in years to come. It's a, it's a project that's funded through the Interreg um, Channel Programme and it involves partnerships in, um, Fr in northern France and the south of England. Um, we have 10 partners, a blend of research and government policy regulating organisations and universities. Um, and th the principal aim of it is to gather new information to improve our management of salmon and sea trout in the transitional coastal waters in the Channel area, but I'm also very keen that the results would be applicable and, tr and transferable to other transitional coastal water areas around the UK as well. I think in, if I, if I think to uh, my fishing companions across the British Isles, very often we, we just think of salmon and sea trout within our own country, but this is a, a collaborative approach across the water to, to mainland Europe. Why is it so important to work closely with a number of partners over there? Um, it's critical because um, both salmon and sea trout, they have marine migration phases as a key part of their life cycle. And you know they, they don't respect international boundaries. Um, so we cannot manage populations unless, unless we work with our neighbors as well. Um, so it, it's a key opportunity and the a heavy focus of so much is around sea trout. And given that uh, our sea trout that leave the English Channel rivers and Northern French rivers spend a lot of their time in the Channel waters. Um, you know, it's key that we work on both areas. Um, there are four sort of key areas of work within the Smash um, project. One is to look at the um, uh, estuarine and survival of um, salmon and sea trout smolts through estuaries, which is a very key issue at the moment, um, and particularly, you know, in line with what the Atlantic Salmon Trust are doing. Um, in addition to that, we're also looking at the marine habitat use of sea trout. Um, we are then also looking at uh, genetics elements, so we're developing a genetic database of sea trout, um, uh, a genetic database of trout in the English Channel. We're collecting information from about 80, 80 rivers so that we can assign sea trout caught at sea back to the rivers of origin. So if any sea trout caught at sea leg illegally, then we know what rivers they come from and we can help target um, that, that, those areas for better protection if, the if where those fish have come from are in rivers where they are classified as at risk or in you know an, an invulnerable state. Um, uh, the other the other area is to provide new information and updated information on um, salmon management um, and salmon um, biology, salmon fecundity, salmon sex ratios. So this can update information in the the governments use to inform their salmon conservation assessment models which are key to their sort of core management policies at the moment. And then altogether, there's a fourth work package that brings it, this all together, which basically means that we're, we're, we're feeding this information using the policy regulators within the project um, to improve current and to manage uh, and to develop new policies for the better management of salmon and sea trout in transitional coastal waters. Hmm. Now, we've talked uh, in previous episodes about the likely suspects framework. I'm, I'm assuming that a lot of this work that you're doing uh, through the Salmon Trout Re Research Centre feed into this. Uh, maybe before you answer that, that question, uh, Ken, just as a, a way of reminding people, uh, likely suspects framework, just uh, concisely, what is that? Well, basically, the concept arose a few years ago, a colleague of ours, Walter Crozier. He'd used this to try and crack a very difficult uh, problem that had arisen in the Irish Sea in relation to cod. So the idea of the likely suspects framework is that you basically assemble all of the potential mortality factors that could occur. And the key to this is boxing off the various areas. So if you think, let's 
talk a bit about sea trout today rather than salmon. So if you think about a sea trout that's migrating out into the ocean, sea trout has to come through various areas in the river. It has to move through the actual estuary. Then it has to move through inshore areas and some of them then move out to sea. So what we're doing is boxing off scientifically the various areas, doing an analysis to see what information, what data exists, and then challenging ourselves to put together a whole series of scientific hypotheses with a view to actually seeing what stands up what are the main factors that are actually causing a drop in terms of overall marine survival in the case of particular sea trout or salmon populations? So it's a way of really organizing the information and testing it scientifically to see what stands up in terms of defendable data, if you like. So, so Dylan, how, how does your work feed into that? And with the research that you've done already, are you able to, to point to any elements that uh, we know now are negatively affecting our either salmon or, or sea trout populations in a way that we can do something about it? Yes, indeed. Uh, firstly, I'd like to say we're very excited about the formation of the Missing Salmon Alliance and um, how our work will feed into the Likely Suspects framework. Um, there are a number of areas that I see where our work can feed into the Likely Suspects framework. To give you some examples of some of the key areas and key bits of information that we've found and some based on some scientific papers we've published recently, um, we've analyzed um, data, long-term data, and found that the sizes of juvenile salmon are declining. Um, and this has been found on rivers in northern France as well, and we're currently investigating to see if this is a wider pattern um, across the UK. Um, the, the, the consequence of declining sizes of fish means that there is a decrease in their um, likely survival at sea. We've also published a paper looking at the um, likelihood to return as an adult if you're a smaller smolt um, compared to a larger smolt. For instance, if you're a 120 millimeter smolt going out to sea um, uh, compared to a 160 millimeter smolt going out to sea, um, you're three and a half times more likely coming back as that bigger smolt to come back as an adult. So that, that is some very key information. We've also found critically that um, when we undertake our um, surveys and our tagging programs in September, between then and our smolts leaving the river in April and May, around about there is a, some 70 to 90% mortality during that winter, during those six month period of our young salmon. So 70 to 90% of our young salmon aren't making it through that winter and out to sea. So that is currently an area of investigation where we're looking to see what are the pinch points and what is causing that mortality in the fruit? Do you have, I'm assuming the answer to this is going to be no, but do you have any baseline idea of what the winter mortality would have been historically? Um, no, we don't, unfortunately. Um, but, you know, obviously if we're losing such a large number of young fish in the river over that period, you know, a huge proportion, um, even if we can just improve it, learn more what was causing it and just improve it, by you know a few percent, then that will lead to an increase in the numbers of smolts leaving the river, and then have a proportional increase in the numbers of adults coming back. And something we do strongly believe is that um, what happens in the river is something we have much more control over than what happens at sea. And we do strongly believe is that you know there are big challenges for salmon at sea, but I think what happens to them in their juvenile stage in the river does have an influence on their survival at sea. So let's see what we can learn and understand more about. Um, during their freshwater stages and that is something that we very much hope to work on through the likely suspects framework um, and through the alliance. Is there any indication as to why the smolts are not putting on as much weight as, the, as they might have done in the past? Well that could be due to changing um, you know obviously due to changing growth and, and we have a PhD student who's currently looking at that at the moment so um, we haven't got an insight or data to suggest why that's happening who knows, it could be declining water quality, um, you know, ri river ecology, um, le less food in the river. Um, but who knows? But we are currently looking at that in, uh, in a lot of detail. So hopefully we, we will come up with some answers in the near future. Yeah. If I could just mention, Byron, maybe just a follow through on that, because we did have a, a small conference a few years ago where we looked at this wonderful inf information from the Froome and looked at equivalent information from other index systems. And it was very interesting to see that, say, for example, at rivers from the west coast of Scotland and so on, where the fish are much slower growing, what we were finding was that we're now growing faster. Um, but 
they were reaching the small stage a year early and as a consequence going to see smaller. And we were very concerned when we found that out because that's certainly, as Dylan was explaining, that's not a good feature. And uh, you have this very, very difficult combination of climate change effects in freshwater, climate change effects then in the salt water as well. And even though we might be looking at relatively large numbers of fish at a younger stage going out, that size differential seems to be critical. And that's been a key finding on quite a number of rivers over the last number of years. Ken, can you, uh, before I could get to the, the last couple of questions for Dylan, can you just tell me what the, the, the blue book is on the likely suspect framework? As yeah, a um, we have had a series in uh, the AST, I think since the late 60s indeed, a blue book series. And what we try to do is if we have a conference or we have a workshop um, or we have a very big uh, meeting of some sort, rather than waiting for the scientific papers to be published, which can take a very long uh, amount of time. And very often they're, pub they're published in separate journals and people find it hard to get their hands on them. But we've, what we've done is we've actually asked scientists, which is something that goes against the grain. We've asked them to give us a scientific summary and we try to make it accessible to the layperson. So there's a whole series of blue books uh, all of the historical ones are there as well on the AST website. And the idea is that they very quickly translate, hopefully into an accessible format, the scientific results of what we've been doing. So we've had three major blue books over the last couple of years, one on the Likely Suspects framework. We've had one on our Smolt conference, which was fascinating in itself. And then we've had the most recent one then in combination, of course, with Dylan and with Janina in the Salmon and Trout uh, Conservation. We uh, have a third blue book out now uh, that's looking at the whole question of tracking and particularly tracking near shore and in the ocean. Hmm. And D Dylan, this was the, the workshop that I think you ran in, in November last year. What were the big takeaways from that? Yes, indeed. Um, firstly, a huge thank you to Ken and Janina. Uh, engineer who works for Salmon and Trout Conservation, who uh, you know did a lot of work on producing a blue book, um, and it's a great format for getting this information out there quickly. Um, yeah, the uh, the workshop came about given that um, uh, you know fish tracking and telemetry, fish telemetry is a key part of our SMARS project, so I was very keen to have uh, an opportunity to bring together key workers from across not just Europe, but also the Pacific region and the, and the East Coast Atlantic. Um, workers there who have a lot of experience on, um, and on marine telemetry, on, particularly on salmonids, and bring them together to, sort of, you know, to share notes and share experiences, learn from each other, and with the ultimate aim of pulling, to, pulling us together and working more closely in the future. Um, the key messages um, that I took away really was that we really do need to work more closely together. There's lots of information out there and lots of good information, lots of experiences. Um, and I think what we also need to do is to bring together a lot of the data and results that, be, that have been produced. For instance, there are, you know, there are various tracking studies that are looking at small survival through estuaries and through lower rivers. Let's analyze all these data together in a meta-analysis to see you know, what, are the, what is the big picture? Um, because there will be variability, but what are the overall trends? Is it a major area that we need to look at in the future? And as a way of uh, bringing this fascinating conversation to a close, uh, the question that is on the lips of, uh, of all fishermen in particular, when they're, they're hearing these in-depth scientific uh, conversations uh, and hearing about the work that people are doing up and down the country, is what potentially are going to be the management changes um, to implement this knowledge? Maybe you could speak to that in your particular area in the, in the English Channel, or what you think they might be, because I understand that the research isn't finished. Yes, there are a number of concerns about interactions between um, coastal netting, inshore netting, um, particularly with gill nets, and, um, and the capture of bycatcher of sea trout. Now, what, one of the key elements of the project is to investigate what areas of habitats sea trout use at sea, and then to see you know, how does this overlap with current fishing activity, netting activity? Are there ways that we can say, you know, maybe we don't net in these areas at certain times of the year because they're important areas for sea trout? So those are things that we're, we're, we're pushing to achieve. Um, we're currently in the data collection um, phase, but we're, we're having some really exciting data coming through 
Um, and this early data, we are feeding it into the, in the consultations on netting bylaws um, through various IFCAs, the Inland Fishery Conservation Authorities, who do manage um, coastal netting around the English coastline. So we are feeding this information in, into there. But we are hoping that we will be able to provide some really good, serious, hard evidence of where sea trout are at sea um, at certain times of year. So that's certainly one uh, key element. Plus, in addition, there are a lot of uh, there's a lot of um, marine planning and coastal development, such as tidal lagoons, wind farm, marine wind farms, underwater hydro schemes. Now, all these are, are, you know have to go through an environmental impact assessment to see whether they're having a negative effect effect on marine ecology. And a key part of that in areas where there are rivers that um, produce salmon and sea trout is that they have they too um, have to consider salmon and sea trout movements as part of their planning process. And what we aim to do is to provide them as well with information and the regulatory bodies with information of you know how sensitive are these areas where they want to undertake these these these, these um, developments um, for salmon and sea trout. So that's another key area that we're working on as well. Dylan, you've given me a long list of things that I now want to look into a little bit more. Ken, do you have uh, anything that you want to add just before we, we close up? No, I don't think so. Just, just to uh, thank Dylan for that fantastic expose in terms of the fantastic work that's happening both through Samarsh and obviously in the Froom as well. We're very, very fortunate to have those great index systems. And tragically, we don't have an index system at the moment in Scotland. We have really wonderful systems in the rest of the British Isles. So that's something collectively I think we really need to work on and make sure that we can put one in place as soon as we can. So I'd just like to thank you, Byron, and to thank Dylan as well for joining us today. That was a really interesting discussion. Hopefully the listeners enjoyed it as much as I did. Um, we'll be sharing more information very shortly in relation to episode four. So please do keep your eyes peeled. Um, in the meantime, if you have any questions for Dylan or for myself, please feel free to leave those questions in the comments and we'll get back to you as quick as we can. Thank you. <laughs>